Okay, Navigator Nation, it is good to be back. Welcome into um, our latest endeavor here. See the uh, COPD Navigator Live, the next generation, which we're going to call Breathe TV from now on. Um, not quite ready to sign the Netflix deal yet, although I certainly wouldn't object. Uh, should it come to that at some point, that would be amazing. Um, the uh, that would real the biggest thing about that would tell us that uh, the message about COPD is getting out into the public, and that is really uh, what this is all about. Uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Mike Hess. I am a respiratory therapist and registered pulmonary function technologist in Michigan. Um, trying to be uh, do what I can to advocate for the COPD community and to improve uh, the quality of life for as many people living with COPD and their caregivers and anybody else affected by it as I can. Um, we've been doing this for a little while now. Uh, COPD Navigator is a group we have here on Facebook. Uh, for a while we were doing a program called COPD Navigator Live. Uh, I had to lay off for a little while because uh, life happens and unfortunately uh, a short break turns into a longer break, turns into an even longer break. Uh, but we are back, uh, hopefully better than ever. We've got some new technology and of course some new glitches that go along with that. Uh, but uh, hopefully as things, uh, things progress here uh, in, uh, um, in the land of ice and snow, the way, what we've had the last couple of weeks or the last couple of days rather, uh, we will get to where we want to be. Uh, this is a, a little bit different setting than you might be familiar with from the old uh, Navigator Live days, and this is indeed not quite our uh, final form. Uh, we are currently uh, um, still working on the, the, the home studio, so to speak, but uh, we're working on that, and uh, in the meantime, the show must go on, so we set up shop here in an alternate location, uh, and hopefully everything is, uh, is going all right for everybody. I do see that uh, we're scrolling a little bit slow here uh, on uh, on on Facebook, so please bear with me if you do ask a question, uh, which is the hallmark of our program here, and I don't see it. Um, just bear with me. I will scroll down to it eventually. Uh, for those of you who are, again, new to the program, what we do here is we start with a little bit of a news update uh, from the world of COPD. Then we have a topic of the day. Uh, today we're going back to basics with COPD 101. Uh, new, new season, new name, new branding. Uh, might as well go back to scratch, uh, start from scratch and uh, build up our knowledge base uh, as we go forward. Uh, and then, of course, after that, uh, we have plenty of time for your questions and answers. Uh, go ahead and drop those in the comments section. Um, we are live right now. Uh, it is a little after noon Eastern time. Uh, what we do is uh, we do the live show and then do a little bit of editing and then throw it up on our YouTube channel, uh, which you will see below. Um, you can always connect with us on... Still haven't learned my right from my left. Uh, you can connect, connect with us all the time, facebook.com slash COPD Navigator. Uh, you can see right now our YouTube channel, we've got some question marks on there. Right now we are at youtube.com slash mucophile, M-U-C-O-P-H-I-L-E, or you can just search for COPD Navigator. I really want to change the, the name of the channel, but YouTube won't let me until I get five more subscribers. So if I can prevail upon any of you or to talk to your friends, go to um, youtube.com, uh, search out COPD Navigator, give me those five uh, subscribers so I can change the name uh, and uh, finish the rebranding process and get everything, make it a little bit easier for people to find. In addition to the rebranding here, uh, we will be doing a series of shorter episodes uh, focused on one particular topic, kind of a spotlight kind of thing. Um, we've had a couple of, uh, of suggestions, some great suggestions already in the group, in the, in the COPD Navigator Facebook group. But if there is a specific topic you want to see, uh, again, drop a comment in the, in the section below or uh, send us a message on our, on our Facebook page. Uh, reach out to us somehow. Let us know uh, what kind of topic you want to uh, refer to or to share with your friends and family, all that sort of thing. In the meantime, we are going to go ahead and get started with our program of the day, which again, we start out with some news here. And hopefully, uh, this is another one of those things, new technology. Things are looking a little bit prettier, but we do have a little bit of work to do uh, smoothing out some of the bumps here. But with that said, uh, topic first, uh, again, it's been quite a while since we've, uh, since we've spoken last. Um, but one of the biggest topics uh, actually came up in the group the other day. Uh, we have one group member on this particular medication now. We do have a new alternative uh, for the, uh, the nebulized, uh, long-acting, uh, anti-muscarinic uh, agent. 
or muscarinic antagonists or anticholinergics or any of the dozen other names that they have. Uh, of course, these are things we're going to be covering later on in the, uh, in the season here as we go on. Um, so what can we talk about? This uh, medication is called Upelry. You can get some more information at the link that is below there. Uh, but basically what we're looking at here, the Upelry is the second uh, long-acting uh, anticholinergic uh, on the market available in a nebulizer, but it is the first that is available in a traditional nebulizer. Uh, earlier last year, we had a medication called Lonhala that came out that is also nebulized, uh, which is, uh, has been a good solution for a lot of people but it does require its own specialty nebulizer and that puts it firmly in the Medicare Part D category which means it hasn't been covered for a lot of people quite frankly not on a lot of formularies not a lot of availability for for folks uh, Upelry does use a standard nebulizer which is a, a generally a good thing uh, I'm not going to tell you it's cheap uh, the standard copay uh, is 20% for Medicare if you don't have a supplement or an advantage plan uh, in which case you might be back into some of those formulary concerns. Uh, the group member that has been using this shared his experience uh, was mentioning a base price of about $1,300 a month. Um, and so, of course, 20% uh, of that is still a pretty significant chunk of change. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be getting some more information about uh, patient support programs and discount coupons and copay cards and all of that kind of fun stuff. Uh, because this does seem like it's going to be a pretty good medication. Uh, works a little bit differently. Uh, same class of medication as med uh, meds like Tudorza, Spiriva, those things that you're probably a little bit more familiar with. A slightly, it seems like a slightly different method of action. Um, so it's going to have a little bit different kind of effect. Um, somewhat less frequent, uh, the what we call the anticholinergic effects. It works on the particular chemical pathway in your body that also tends to affect things like um, saliva production, um, uh, dry eye, that sort of thing. So if you have too many of these anticholinergics, you can get some of those effects. Uh, Upelry doesn't, uh, in, in early studies that are, again, perhaps a little bit biased, you know, we always have to consider who's paying for the studies and that sort of thing. They do seem objective. They are peer-reviewed, all that stuff, but uh, there's always kind of that cloud that hangs around a lot of these studies. Uh, but they do appear, uh, this drug does appear to have uh, fewer anticholinergic side effects uh, and fewer uh, side effects in general, uh, actually. Uh, most commonly reported uh, adverse reactions are uh, COPD exacerbations, uh, nasal pharyngitis or swelling inflammation in the upper airways, uh, upper respiratory infection, cough, and back pain. Uh, now, these are commonly reported adverse effects. How much of them are directly attributable to Upelry? It's always difficult to say. I was at a meeting with, uh, with uh, on, I believe it was this particular medication, uh, and the group shared a story that during the clinical trial, one of the people who was on the medication was actually uh, attacked and killed by uh, another person. And so they unfortunately now have to list homicide as a potential adverse reaction just because that's how weird some of these labeling laws are now. Um, so yeah, these are things that are going to happen to you, uh, whether you, whatever medication you take. You look at cough suppressants, the side effect is listed as cough. You look at things that um, make your nose not run, you know, that, that's a side effect. Uh, it's just, it's weird stuff like that. So always bear that in mind too when you're looking at some of these warning labels and uh, um, take them with the appropriate number of grains of salt. Uh, in good news, Upelry does seem to uh, reduce uh, somewhat the frequency of COPD exacerbations uh, in the whole population. Um, we're looking at maybe instead of having one every other year, you would have one every third year. Um, so it might be a little bit of a, of a benefit. Um, it, again, difficult to say over the long haul how that's all going to shake out uh, and whether uh, some of these extra price tags are worth uh, uh, worth that advantage. But um it's going to be another option, and that is, uh, generally speaking, pretty good news. Uh, next on the agenda today, we have uh, um, this thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. Of course, uh, medications are kind of a frontline um, therapy in COPD. Uh, they are one of the strongest weapons we have. They are one of the most frequently uh, used tools in the toolbox. But we do tend to get a little bit over-reliant on medication sometimes, my own personal opinion. Um, I, one of the uh, leading COPD advocates out there once told me that uh, she uses uh, medications to, uh, to exercise in order to exercise, and it's the exercise that really gives her the benefit that allows her to live. 
Uh, and that's really what we should, as a, as a medical profession, kind of be looking at. We, we need to look far beyond the pharmacology of it and look at some of these other things that are going on. And that's why studies like this, talking about this, this idea of cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy, are really important. Uh, is cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, as defined by the Mayo Clinic, is a common type of talking therapy uh, where you work with, uh, generally speaking, a mental health counselor, mental health professional, uh, in a structured way, attending a certain number of, of sessions and working through a particular program, uh, helps people become aware of inaccurate or negative thinking uh, so that you can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them more effectively. So it's basically a form of counseling in which you kind of identify some of the negative uh, aspects of your thought processes and work to overcome those. And where that ties into COPD is we know that so many people who deal with this uh, tend to get anxious, tend to get depressed, and then that leads to isolation, and then that leads to kind of this downward spiral of uh, all kinds of bad things happening. So we're looking at how can we help those folks um, through some of these other non-traditional means. And so we're looking at this cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a study that came out of England um, and looked at uh, about 279 people and compared they had their, uh, what they called an active control group where they still did an intervention. In this case, they gave folks uh, leaflets, instructional brochures, that sort of thing on how to best manage anxiety in the setting of COPD. Uh, and then the other group, they gave these sessions of this cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and they found that uh, um, there were definite improvements uh, using some of the tools that we have to measure anxiety level uh, and also found potential benefits in depression. Uh, the tool that they used to, to measure the depression they found um, reached what they consider statistical significance but did not quite reach what they call the minimum clinically important difference. So it might still be it's in kind of a gray area is the bottom line there. Uh, and they also found, uh, and this is going to be uh, most important to getting this kind of thing implemented, they found that over the long term, it was actually less expensive. It was less expensive to pay for these sessions, pay for the training for these clinicians to provide these sessions uh, and to do this material than it was to treat those folks who uh, ended up with exacerbations and that sort of thing. Uh, this cognitive behavioral therapy was able to cut down on some of that number uh, and was uh, more cost effective. And uh, uh, so it kind of hits it from both ends. It's cheaper to do uh, and it's just as effective to help people out. So uh, very important stuff. Um, on a similar note, uh, we all know one of the most important interventions we have uh, for COPD is our old friend pulmonary rehabilitation or pulmonary rehab. Unfortunately, even though we know how effective it is, it is still way, way underutilized. And this new study from uh, that was just recently published uh, in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society bears that out again. This was a pretty significant um, review study where they looked at records um, of nearly a quarter of a million people. Sorry, I had to do some quick math in my head there. Not used to thinking on my feet anymore. Um, nearly a quarter of a million people. Uh, the study was funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So again, pretty objective. Looked at the records. These are people who were uh, hospitalized with the COPD exacerbation and found that a uh, grand total of about 4,000 of them actually got referred to pulmonary re rehabilitation uh, within uh, six months of their discharge from the hospital. That's less than 2% of all of those folks uh, who could potentially really benefit from, from pulmonary rehab uh, actually getting access to it. Uh, even if when they opened the window out to 12 months, uh, barely made it to 3.5%, uh, bumped up to about 6,000 people. So over the course of an entire year, only about, uh, uh, again, less than 3% of these people actually got referred to these programs. And they found that um, some of the bigger barriers to getting access to the programs were uh, if you were older, uh, if you were 75 years of, of age or older, um, if you lived more than 10 miles from a program, uh, or if you had low socioeconomic status, which of course many people uh, living on a fixed income um, have those barriers. Uh, they found that all of those things were, were tremendous barriers to people getting pulmonary rehab. And so there's a lot of potential reasons for that. There are a lot of clinicians that say, well, you're already... Uh, you're, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're already, you know, at this advanced stage. You're, you're this, you're that. Um, you know, we're not even going to bother referring you. 
or if you live ten, more than 10 minutes away, it's difficult for you to get to these programs, so you're not going to use them. Uh, or you can't afford the copay. We go back to some of those other issues. Again, this is often a 20% a copay thing, and when you're doing the, that 20% three times a week, again, on a fixed income, it is really difficult for a lot of folks to get access to this service. So, um, Basically, the bottom line is, as the uh, as the ATS put it, uh, in this national study of, uh, hate the word elderly, but that's what they used, Medicare beneficiaries uh, hospitalized for COPD, we found an enormous gap between the recommendations found in professional society guidelines and recent clinical practice. Uh, the vast majority of individuals who might benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation never receive it, and we cannot let that happen. Uh, a big part of that is going to be with us as clinicians obviously we talked to we just heard there's a gap between what we know we should be doing and what we're actually doing uh, and unfortunately a lot of that is also going to lay on your shoulders out there um, a similar study also funded by ATS found that 62 percent of people with COPD are not aware of pulmonary rehabilitation programs um, again, a lot of that falls on us, but a lot of it, it falls on those of us who are involved in advocacy and education efforts to get that information out to you folks so that you can go to your clinician and say, hey, why haven't you referred me to this? Or to go to your local uh, dirty word politicians and say, hey, how come you aren't fighting for better access to pulmonary rehabilitation? How come we're not doing a better job with Medicare reimbursement, Medicaid reimbursement, third party reimbursement? How do we fix this problem together? Uh, and so that's where that's where we that's where we're at with pulmonary rehab. We're going to need to get all hands on deck to push this forward, uh, and we really need to uh, to do it pretty quickly. Otherwise, we're still wasting a lot of money and uh, unfortunately a lot of lungs for a lot of people. So. Uh, stepping down off the soapbox a little bit, when we're talking about who's going to benefit from pulmonary rehab, who are we talking about? Of course, uh, if you're watching this program, you probably already know uh, this whole concept of COPD. Uh, but I do, like I said, we're kind of going back to the beginning here. So I want to take just a couple of minutes and uh, talk about, um, uh, can we spell you? Upelry, uh, I'm, I'm thinking we're talking about Upelry. It is in back in the in some of the uh, the video there. It is on the screen. We will make sure to drop it in the comments below too. Um, but at any rate, we're going to go back. Um, and what are we talking about when we're talking about COPD? Well, uh, of course, we can look at the very uh, the clinical. Um, textbook definition chronic obstructive pulmonary disease we can break it down that way we know that chronic means it is ongoing uh, we know obstructive means that there is some kind of blockage uh, in this case it's going to be in the lungs we'll get into that a little bit later on we start talking about diagnostics pulmonary of course talks about the lungs and disease and pretty sure it's pretty self-explanatory uh, but what are we talking about exactly we have kind of we used to have this this, this idea of COPD as kind of two distinct processes. We had this idea of, you know, first we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to talk about the main symptoms of COPD um, because this is where, uh, again, we as clinicians fall down a lot. And this is one of my areas of, of uh, particular focus here in, in uh, Kalamazoo, southwestern Michigan area, where we're trying to a new uh, initiative called Breathe Kalamazoo to try to get more awareness of some of these early factors because clinicians will report that one of the biggest barriers to getting people the right diagnosis and connected with the resources they need is people under report these kind of symptoms. So of course number one shortness of breath. Um, when you get more tired than you want to, when you get more tired than people your age, your peer group, um, a lot of times people will attribute it to just getting older or maybe they're out of shape. And of course, certainly that can be a factor. But it's also to remember if you have some of the risk factors for COPD, like a history of smoking or living around pollution um, or living around secondhand smoke, living around uh, fumes, dust, all that kind of stuff. And if you have that early shortness of breath, that can be a factor. Not everybody necessarily just gets a shortness of breath. A lot of times we see people complain about coughing. It can be a dry cough, can be a productive cough. But again, that's a sign of some of that inflammation that's building up in the chest, in the airways, uh, in, in, the, in the tissue inside those lungs, um, and leading to inflammation and a lot of other bad things going on. Um, some of which is uh, what we clinically call mucus hypersecretion, which is a fancy way of you're just making too much junk, too much phlegm, mucus, junk, 
goobers, whatever you want to call it, you're making too much of it. It's hanging around in there. It's usually making you cough a lot more uh, and doing all that kind of stuff. So these are kind of the, the three hallmark symptoms. Um, most people have, it can vary from day to day how much of a proportion you get from one to the other. Um, but these are kind of the, the hallmarks of, of what we're looking for and what we want people to start thinking about and get them to start thinking about COPD uh, because, again, these things are, are underreported or confused with other things. You know, maybe, well, maybe I just, maybe I just get bronchitis every year. Well, maybe you do, or maybe you have it all the time and we start looking at chronic bronchitis, which is one of the forms of COPD. Um, maybe, uh, you know, like I said, I'm just, you know, now I'm 50, I'm slowing down a little bit, I'm out of shape. I haven't smoked for 20 years, so it can't be anything like that. I'm just out of shape. Well, that's not necessarily the case. What we need to do is be able to look at some of these risk factors and look at some of these early symptoms and figure out where we're going with them. So where are we going with them? We threw out the word chronic bronchitis a little while ago. So what is that? Well, again, we look at, um, some of the, the, the main things around COPD and we look at um, this idea of chronic you know, we're going to break it down again all the time um, and we have bronchitis or inflammation of the the bronchi inside the uh, um, inside the lungs the little airways inside the lungs um, so we can look at the little picture here and we see our healthy airways are um, pretty well you know you can get pretty good uh, chunk of air through there it's looking pretty good um, things aren't too swollen uh, things are pretty clear um, um, and we're able to move a lot of stuff through there. And we look at our other uh, our other airway there, and we start looking at some of these infl this inflammation characteristics. Um, a lot of these this excess phlegm and mucus kind of stuff that comes in when we have these ongoing irritants. Again, uh, eighty percent of cases are caused by smoking. Um, but 20% are caused by exposure to other pollutants. Um, wood smoke, especially when we look out into the, the developing world, we see a lot of people still cooking with wood or biofuels, and we see that that's causing a lot of, of COPD cases in those settings. So this is, um, again, most cases are, are caused by, by smoking, but this is not just a smoker's disease. And it's really important that uh, we as clinicians continue to recognize that a little bit. Um, and it's important to, um, for folks to recognize, uh, the general population to recognize that we can't just look at this as uh, um, just people who smoked. <clears throat> um, we also look at um, this idea of emphysema, which is a word that gets thrown around a lot with um, uh, COPD. You know, a lot of times we look at, uh, when we look at diagnosis codes and things like that, we look at, is it emphysema, is it chronic bronchitis? Uh, most people have a little bit of a mix in between. They have elements of both and, and both of them going on at various parts inside of their lungs. Uh, so the idea of emphysema is basically kind of a, a stretch out of some of these little air sacs in the lungs where the good air, the oxygen comes in, and the bad air, the carbon dioxide, goes out. Uh, when you have these obstructions that are often caused by the inflamed uh, airways or the, the hypersecretion that we call it, um, that air kind of gets trapped in these alveoli. And just like you in a balloon, if you stop the air from getting out, kind of stretches out over time. Um, that's really, that's the emphysema part of it. We lose um, some of the surface area, believe it or not, inside the lung, so it's harder for the oxygen to get in, the carbon dioxide to get out. Um, and um, it's also, we lose some of the, the recoil. If you think about the, the older school latex balloons, um, you know, when you blow it up, it stretches out, and then when you let it go, everything wants to recoil back down to its original spot. Well, your lungs kind of work very similarly, and uh, as that gets stretched out, you lose some of that recoil. And so the combination of, uh, of these, two, uh, these two conditions, the combination effects of these, uh, lead to this obstruction that we see uh, as the part of COPD. Sometimes we can see it on x-ray. This is an x-ray from a really cool website called Radiopedia, where um, we can actually look. This is a chest x-ray of somebody with emphysema. We see that the lungs have kind of gotten stretched out a little bit. We see uh, the dark spot is where we see more air, is air basically, uh, more air than tissue. Uh, so we see that uh, there has been a lot of that stretching. The lungs are um, physically bigger, even though they've lost some of that gas exchange space. Um, and we have that. 
but that is not the true diagnostic tool of COPD. In order to officially diagnose chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, we need to do a thing called spirometry or pulmonary function testing. Uh, generally speaking, uh, spirometry is part of pulmonary function testing, so sometimes you'll see uh, the word get thrown around um, as part of, you know, whatever. Um, you'll, your provider will send you for PFTs or they will do spirometry right in the office. In order to do that, that's what we look at. We look at how the air is getting in and out of your lungs. Uh, and so this was a great, um, a great set of diagrams that I found on RT Magazine. A lot of these graphics today are coming from RT Magazine. Um, the first thing we're going to do, the first one we see right here, this is kind of a normal spirometry pattern. And we look at, um, it, it's going to be a little bit backwards. Uh, on the bottom here is where, I uh, can't do that because it's on the screen. Uh, the bottom curve is actually an inhalation loop where you're, the air is going in, uh, goes in in a very nice pattern, very uh, regular pattern. And then when you blow out forcefully with normal lungs, you get a lot of that elastic recoil and you're able to push all that stuff out a lot. And most of your air comes out in the first second. We call that the forced expiratory volume in one second or FEV1. And so you can see uh, when we're looking at the normal spirometry curve, uh, a lot of that comes out right at the beginning and then it kind of tapers off for a while. And so we look at the ratio of what comes out in that first second to what comes out all together. And we want to make sure that at least 70% of that is coming out in the first second. Uh, we look at the second curve there, the one that is actually labeled COPD. And we see that, yeah, you get a bit uh, right at the beginning and then it really scoops out a lot because there is, you lose a lot of that elastic recoil. There's the, the blockages in there. It takes a lot longer for the rest of the air to come out, uh, especially as you start getting tired as the breath goes on and so on and so forth. Um, we can also look at a lot of these other defects on here. We look at uh, uh, an extra thoracic obstruction. Uh, a lot of times we'll see that if you have a problem with your vocal cords or something like that, that gives you very similar symptoms to asthma or COPD, uh, including the cough, including a lot of that other stuff, which is why it's so important to do the actual diagnostic test instead of just assume you know what somebody has. We can also see a cough, and so that can tell us if um, we're actually getting good data. Uh, we can look at restrictive lung disease, which again presents often very similarly to COPD, um, but where all of the, the functions are a little bit uh, uh, diminished. Uh, and then finally, we, we look at some other obstructions there. So it is really important that we do actual diagnostic testing because again, we can look at an X-ray and we can see, we can actually see the idea of emphysema because that's a physical change, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with um, whether you have obstruction or not. If it gets to a point where you really do have obstruction, then yes, of course you're gonna see that. And uh, the bottom line is there can be a lot of confounding factors. Right now, the gold standard is not to do it uh, by symptoms, not to do it by imaging, but to actually do it by spirometry, which is what we're seeing here. So uh, what else do we have? Once we have diagnosed COPD, uh, we have uh, made a proper diagnosis, of course, and we start looking at therapies. I'm a respiratory therapist, that's what we do. We provide therapy for respiration, try to get people to breathe better, breathe easier, uh, every cliche under the sun. And uh, as we mentioned before, our frontline stuff is medications. Probably uh, most of you have seen uh, some, if not all of the medications on this list, or uh, on this picture, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, this particular graphic is two generations old. So we can see that uh, we have boatloads of different medications out there, uh, but it is also very difficult to keep them straight. And so it's very important for a lot of the clinicians out there to be either um, be referring to, you have a reference guide, this particular poster comes from the Asthma and Allergy Network, I'm not affiliated with them, but they have fantastic materials. Um, so I encourage uh, any of the clinicians in the audience, get one of these posters, make sure you get one every year, every other year or so. Um, I have a couple of new ones hanging in my office right now, but I, this is uh, the, the graphic I was able to find. Um, we also need to make sure that we are matching the inhaler to the person using it. Uh, this is a struggle we're facing a lot uh, in a lot of different avenues, but we have a lot of people uh, who are controlling the purse strings that don't understand that um, inhalers are not like pills. Uh, if you can swallow a pill, you can swallow a capsule, you can swallow a caplet, you can swallow a tablet. 
you can basically interchange a lot of those things. Um, and if one isn't working, you can go to another one. Inhalers are not like that. Each one of these devices on this poster has different characteristics. They have a different internal resistance. They have different need for coordination. They have different uh, inhalation speeds. Uh, it's very difficult to use them as a one-size-fits-all solution. And so we as clinicians need to be very mindful of that and not only understand our options, but understand how to pick the right option. And that's, that is going to be a topic that comes up uh, next, uh, in two weeks on our, our next episode where we dive a little bit deeper into medications. But again, while medications are critical and are very important, we do need to recognize that there are other things that we need to encourage people to do as well. Uh, and again, we, at the beginning of the show, we talked a little bit about pulmonary rehabilitation, which is a fantastic tool that we have, uh, a horribly underutilized tool. But even if you're not going to a formal pulmonary rehabilitation program, uh, you can also just do exercises on your own. And we're not even talking about going to the gym. You know, again, I'm very mindful of a lot of folks on uh, fixed incomes, low incomes, everything else. These can be things that you can do in the comfort of your own home. Uh, as basic as getting soup cans. Uh, and while you're watching TV or watching me ramble on here on YouTube or Facebook, just do some lifts. Work your upper body a little bit. Make sure that's going on. Get up, um, walk in place for a little bit. Take some literal baby steps. I know it's difficult to think about exercising uh, when you get out of breath simply going to the restroom, but the way to improve that is to make these slow steps and start building. And uh, I, I look at and I can I use this analogy a lot with a lot of different things in medicine. But uh, for those of you who are uh, fans of The Price Is Right, I was of course grew up with Bob Barker. Uh, one of my favorite ones was a little mountain climber guy. You know, you'd have that do 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 you know, and you'd climb up the mountain. It would go very slowly, and hopefully, you don't get over the edge. But it work recovering your lung function is often very similar to that. You just make these small incremental changes, and all of a sudden, you are actually breathing better. You can go to the restroom, or check the mail, or whatever, or play with your grandkids, or whatever it is, and you're not getting as short a breath as fast. By no means am I saying it's easy. By no means am I saying that uh, um, you should be doing it right now and tomorrow you'll be seeing better effects. But it is possible to, to be a bit better uh, one day at a time. And the last thing that we have um, in, our, in our arsenal here, in our toolbox, is... Um, There's a novel, minimally critical. invasive uh, treatment, so the Renew of, Coil, uh, uh, designed for emphysema. And, uh, we call bronchoscopic options, which are less invasive. Patented shape memory nitinol coils are programmed with a double loop. Straighten for insertion into the lung, they then return to their original coiled shape. This unique action gathers in loose, diseased tissue, which is expected to shorten treated airways and retention the lung. We have 10 to 12 coils are typically placed throughout an upper or lower lung to provide retensioning of the entire airway network. Maximal benefit is achieved with bilateral treatment. The coils are designed to improve lung function in three key ways. To have a retensioning effect on adjacent lung tissue, thus enabling more efficient contraction during the breathing cycle to tether and hold open small airways, preventing airway collapse, which reduces air trapping and hyperinflation, and to compress disease tissue, improving diaphragm mobility and providing room for healthier tissue to function. Only Numerex has developed a minimally invasive treatment designed to improve patient outcomes through mechanical reduction of air trapping and hyperinflation. The Renew Coil, designed for emphysema. We just we have too many uh, too many people in need of, of that stuff to uh, um, to not fight for that. So uh, again, a little soapboxy there, if, uh, if, um, but that's what that's that's how I roll. <laughs> so it's a lot of information um again these are this is just a very a relatively broad overview of where we are with copd what we're talking about when we're talking about copd uh the various forms of the disease and we have new stuff coming out literally every day 
Um, we used to, again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, we used to look at COPD as basically this whole idea of on, on uh, we had chron uh, chronic bronchitis on one side, we had emphysema on the other side, um, and those were like our two big things. We had uh, the pinks and the blues. And then we kind of started realizing that, well, now it's a little bit more of a spectrum or a continuum, and some people have more chronic bronchitis and some people have more emphysema, but you usually have some of both and you fit somewhere in there. And now we're starting to talk about, we have all of these different, what we call phenotypes or different classifications of COPD. Uh, we have the, the genetic form of COPD that we haven't even really talked about much today, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which usually comes on a little bit earlier uh, and is, uh, you can see it in, in family lines. We have people who have frequent exacerbations. We have people who don't really have uh, much exacerbation at all, but they have this, this restricted lung function. We have people who um, their, their lung function, uh, the obstruction, their, the change in their FEV1 doesn't really correlate with their exercise tolerance. We have people who have all the risk factors and all the symptoms of COPD, but their spirometry doesn't quite hit that cutoff of the, the, the 70% um, in the first second. So it, technically they don't have COPD, even though the rest of their life is just like a, uh, somebody who is living with COPD. Um, we have all of these different phenotypes and we're learning more and more about what to do with each of them. We're, we're, we've taken some of the, these broad studies that we've had and we've realized that, well, a lot of times we're looking at people with relatively advanced forms of COPD uh, because we haven't done a very good job at screening and diagnostics and all that fun stuff. But maybe if we applied some of these things that we think don't work and we put them earlier in the process, maybe that can have some impact. Um, maybe we need to be looking at some other surgical features or you know maybe we need to be looking at better medications different medications new medication classes uh, research is going all the time to try to figure out uh, uh, pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical therapies and uh, of course advocacy also uh, getting people access to the the things that they need the knowledge the information the resources the the exercise programs um, we, uh, again, to touch a little bit on what we're doing here in, in Michigan, we're trying to develop the idea of uh, Harmonicas for Health, a program that was developed by the COPD Foundation that helps out a lot of people um, do better with their, their breathing pattern uh, and gets people social. You know, going back into the whole uh, anxiety, depression loop that the cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is trying to help. We want people to feel not alone. We want people to know that there are people other people with COPD and uh, people who are um, affected by it, clinicians and caregivers and everybody else who are trying to work uh, on everybody's behalf to get people connected with what they need. Um, it, it, it's very disappointing when you feel alone sometimes. It, it's troubling and it leads to a lot more uh, anxiety and depression. And we know that when you have trouble breathing, you're more reluctant to go out. You skip activities with friends and family. You stay in and then you get more isolated. And then uh, it's a whole big issue. But if the biggest thing that we can uh, help people understand uh, in the community is that they are not alone. And uh, we also need to help people outside the community and the general public understand that uh, um, this is a disease that, that needs a lot more attention than it's getting. It's not, uh, not one of the sexier things. We don't have a great ad campaign yet. Um, we don't have a lot of the attention that uh, other public health crises are facing, but we need it. Um, th these, are, these are big impacts. These are huge impacts uh, personally and as a community, and we need to draw a little bit more attention to that. So um, in summary, um, what is COPD? Well, we'll go back to uh, gold. Uh, we talked a little bit, um, uh, made a joke, uh, well, inside joke, I guess, about the gold standard. There is a group called the Global uh, Initiative for um, Obstructive Lung Disease, uh, which is uh, goes by gold and does a lot of worldwide advocacy efforts and coordinates a lot of worldwide research. And uh, they come out with a report uh, every year or so, uh, uh, revisions to the report, and their current definition of COPD uh, is a common preventable and treatable disease that is characterized by persistent symptoms and airflow limitation due to airway or uh, alveolar abnormalities. Alveoli are the little air sacs in there that get stretched out, uh, usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. So to break it down into actual English, um, it's, a, it's a disease that is caused by 
some kind of pollution, some kind of irritant, whether it's tobacco smoke, wood smoke, whatever it is, it's usually caused by something like that. Uh, it is common. It is uh, depending on what data you look at or what uh, how you divvy up some of the other processes, the third or fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, similarly, third around the world. It is preventable. Uh, of course, again, 80% of uh, the cases are caused by tobacco smoke. So if we were able to get everybody to stop smoking tomorrow, 80% of COPD would, would go away over the course of the next uh, 30, 40 years. Um, but we still have to wor worry about wood smoke. We still have to worry about vaping. We have to worry about all that kind of stuff. And we have to worry about environmental exposures. It, it's still preventable if you use your proper respiratory equipment, if you work around fumes and dusts and particles and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is, in most cases, theoretically preventable. Uh, and it is treatable. Um, we don't yet have a definitive cure for COPD, but we do have a lot of treatments to help you manage symptoms and to uh, get back some of that exercise tolerance and reduce the activity limitation and all that kind of stuff uh, so that you can get, uh, get to be living your, your best life, even in the face of a lot of these, these lung conditions. So. Um, with that, that is the, the overview, the very basics, the uh, 10,000 mile view, I guess they call it, 10,000 foot view um, of COPD from a clinical perspective. Um, and thus concludes our lesson plan for today. Uh, this is the, the fun part of the program where um, you have been very patient. And uh, now we'll take a look at some of the questions that you have on Facebook. We definitely... Um, have some time uh, um, have some time left in the scheduled program today uh, need to turn down the volume on the video uh, per Craig here I'm not entirely sure how to do that uh, on my end I can probably turn down the, the gain a little bit here um, maybe that'll help a little bit um, might be easier for folks to adjust the volume on their end but we will turn down that gain a little bit here and see if that helps at all um, this is, as I said, this is a, a new setup here. Got a, a brand new microphone, brand new camera. Um, really looking forward to doing a lot more media kind of stuff here. Um, so, but uh, this, again, this part of the program is driven by you folks. So if you have some questions here, um, please drop them in the comments. I'm going to scroll back here and see what we've got. We've got some of our, our uh, longtime friends of the program, longtime friends of the group, COPD Navigator, joining us today. I uh, love to see all these names and familiar faces. It is really good to be back and uh, and spending some time with you folks. Um, Judy mentions uh, beginning stage three rehab. Uh, beginning stage three rehab when first diagnosed stage two. Um, so staging is, uh, not, this isn't technically a question, but we're going to throw this out there too. Staging is really a, a tricky issue. Um, we have, for a long time, uh, it was thought that COPD was very lineal, linearly progressive, where once you got it, you it was the reverse of the mountain climber guy from Price is Right. You just steadily kind of went downhill until everything was done. And so they came up with these, these staging classifications based on how how much less than predicted your FEV1 was, how much limitation you had in that first second. Um, and it worked well for a while. I mean, we as clinicians, we love to put people in boxes or assign them numbers or whatever, give them categories. Uh, it worked okay for a while. It gave us some insight as to, you know, longevity or, you know, what kind of therapy should we pers uh, be pursuing for folks. Um, but at the end of the day, the more research we do, the more we find that when we put somebody in a stage it doesn't really help all that much at the individual level. We can do population research and some of the very broad scale things and that's okay. Uh, but when we're looking at how we're defining somebody's therapy plan, management plan, whatever we want to call it, that whole spirometry number is, is less effective than we would want it to be. So again, uh, throwing back to gold here, they came up with a scheme that looks at uh, symptom burden and how often you have exacerbations. Uh, they put people literally in a box. They've got this four square box that uh, um, has different classes in it. Uh, and on the one, on the, the, the one, the X axis, the long way, um, you have uh, your score on what's called the COPD assessment test, which looks at different symptoms like coughing and shortness of breath and all that. And if you hit, if you're 10 or less, you're at relatively low burden. 
you're at uh, 10 or higher, you're at a relatively high burden. And then on the, the vertical axis, it looks at exacerbations. If you've had two exacerbations in the last year or one that put you in the hospital, then you are at high risk for future exacerbations. If you've only had a one over the last year or you, and you haven't been to the hospital, then you're relatively low. And so looking at those more functional things, that gives us a little bit better view of how we should be treating folks, uh, what resources we should be connecting them with, what kind of therapies, whether it's inhalers or antibiotics or what else we've got going on. Uh, and that has been a little bit more successful that in the short term. You know, of course, this only happened within the last five years or so. So yeah, it, it's difficult to get some of this information just because we don't have the time frame yet. But to me, that's a far more effective way of categorizing folks and making sure that they're on the right kind of plan. So um, when we talk about beginning stage three, you know, that it, it's tricky that's the language that many of us clinicians use, but we do have to be careful when we're using that with folks so that we're not giving off the wrong impression. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the analogies like the lung age and stuff like that. I want the practical information, how we can help people and, and what we're going to do about it. So, uh, but appreciate you joining us today. Uh, certainly. Uh, let's see. Uh, the use of the illustrations was a bonus as well. Thank you, John. Uh, and <laughs> we went from turning down the volume to now we got to turn the volume back up. So we're going to we'll put it back up and I will leave it to your individual volume controls and uh, we'll, we'll work on this together. Uh, after the fact here, I'll go back and record the uh, uh, review the video and see what we can do about the, the microphone and all that stuff. Uh, honestly, I'm just glad something's coming through. I was a little concerned at first that uh, we we're having an outage. Everything had tested out OK before, but uh, now it's... Who knows? Gremlins, ice storms, whatever we want to, whatever it can be. Um, the cool thing about doing this uh, um, on the, on the, in this format is we are, I do have some software that's able to, to throw up some graphics for us. I try to do that whenever we have these videos. Um, I try to do, and I'm trying to find more, more high quality things. Uh, that's why we've gone from a weekly schedule to a bi-weekly schedule. It's going to be a little bit easier to do a little bit of the prep work and all that kind of stuff in addition to the, the shorter takes that we're, that we're out there doing. But uh, again, I, I'm seeking your input on a lot of this stuff. I want to be an effective resource for as many people as I can. Um, I can't tell you, um, the, I can't necessarily tell you the right thing, the wrong thing for your case because I don't know you like your clinicians know you. Uh, so I look at my job as giving you the tools that you need to be a partner in your care and to go to your clinician, to go to your care team and say, can we try this? Have you thought of this? And all that stuff. Because for a variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is uh, we have put a lot of our providers in a, in a time crunch um, because of the way the system is designed. Um, they're not able to keep up with a lot of this information. And so again, it, it stinks. But we rely on people with the, the process or with, with what people with COPD in this case to be those active partners and to be your own best advocate. So maybe not entirely fair um, as a clinician. I don't think it's entirely fair that we expect that of you folks. It, it's our job to give you the best practices, but unfortunately, we're not always able to keep up with that. So uh, please keep us on your toes or <laughs> please keep us on our toes. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, so the volume went too low again. We are going to go. So we did bump it back up a bit. Hopefully, hopefully it's enough. Hopefully it's. So from now on, we know we're just going to keep it high and we'll rely on folks to turn down their own volumes and all that kind of stuff. Kim asks, uh, any idea when we will have harmonica class again? Um, we are still working on identifying that. Um, I need to get with, um, we have a local harmonicas for health class, um, which we have had been on hiatus. We had hoped to get some, um, some stuff locked down, but we've had some transitions on uh, my program. We we're just working on some facilities and that sort of thing. Um, I would look for that to come back in February here in southwestern Michigan. Um, if anybody else happens to be watching this in southwestern Michigan, please be sure to drop us a line uh, in the comments on any of the, the posts that you have found this on. Shared this through a couple of different avenues, so hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to reach us in one of those places. 
um, and uh, we will definitely keep you posted on when that is returning. Um, hopefully we'll have some some better answers in the next couple of weeks, but uh, like I said, I would definitely look at a uh, return of that uh, coming up here in February. Uh, so I'm going to switch back over to another group video. All right, and then I got another message that said there's another video talking over. So I don't really know what that's going on. Oh, the coil guy I didn't turn the video down on that one. Okay. All right, so that is uh, that's a technical issue that I just totally forgot about because I'm out of practice. But uh, the coil guy was talking over me there, so apologize for that. I will get back in the swing of things here. Uh, going back into COPD Navigator, the Facebook group, and I encourage anybody who's uh, interested in joining our community to, of course, do that. Uh, question is, is it okay for someone to get a root canal done if they have COPD? And again, that is, it's a difficult question to answer 100% um, certainty. Uh, there are definitely some increased risks with the kind of procedure that happens. It's going to depend on the kind of sedation that you have. Um, it's going to depend on a lot of the other factors, how um, how significant the, the COPD is, uh, how severe it is, um, you know, oxygen, all that kind of stuff. Um, in general, yes, it is it is safe and possible for that to happen. But there are definitely some con um, some extra concerns that need to be addressed um, when you are uh, looking at any kind of any kind of procedure like that. So um, it it is possible for sure. But definitely talk to your your clinical team, your your dentist, and uh, whoever is managing your COPD, uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page and is aware of some of the complicating factors and the risks involved and all that sort of thing. Um, so let's see what else we got for questions. Uh, Kathy, love the Wednesday live. Couldn't always watch on Friday. Yes, that is, uh, we are back to where it all began. Uh, we used to do this on Fridays, but now we're back to Wednesdays just because that's, uh, that's what works for right now. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to get, uh, a lot of people to join us, uh, regularly. And uh, again, if not, we've got a couple other avenues where people can contribute and participate and interact in all those fun buzzwords. Uh, we've got this going. We've got uh, we'll have the YouTube channel going pretty soon. We'll have uh, a lot of other options for people to uh, to contribute and to say hi and join in. So um, it's good to be back. It's good to be back on Wednesday. It's good to be back um, with the audience and everything. Uh, hopefully that uh, hopefully we've got some of the, the technical issues resolved. Um, again, like I said at the very beginning, wouldn't be a season premiere if we didn't have some kind of glitches here and there. Uh, we look to be in our permanent home um, by the next time uh, we see each other in two weeks when we'll be talking about medications. We'll be talking about the different classes of medications. We'll be talking about the different inhaler devices out there, uh, the nebulizers that are out there. Uh, we'll be doing a much deeper dive into medications, why we do certain things, uh, why certain things conflict with each other, so on and so forth. Uh, so be sure that you're thinking of any of your medication questions. Uh, if you want those answered live, uh, drop them in the comments and say, hey, for next time. Uh, otherwise, we'll try and get them answered for you um, prior to that. Um, if you have anything in particular you want to see, uh, drop those in the comments. We'll try to get that on there. I have a fairly good selection of devices to demonstrate and all that sort of thing. A couple of fun gizmos that we like to play with to help make sure people are on the right device and uh, so on and so forth. So not seeing any other questions come through. Uh, Craig, yes, this will be every two weeks. Uh, the live session will be every two weeks. We've got, uh, if you go to our uh, Facebook page, COPD Navigator, um, there is a, uh, that's the one that has the uh, COPD in a lighthouse. Um, that has a list of the ones we have scheduled all the way through April. Um, the Wednesday of the, uh, uh, the first one in April, um, we do have a mild conflict that is a respiratory conference that I will be uh, helping to lead. So I'm looking at how I can carve out some time to do this for that. But we might adjust the schedule a little bit to match that or we might just uh, uh, adjust the topic and uh, maybe get some COPD thoughts from some of our conference attendees. Um, but otherwise, yes, we are looking at every two weeks uh, for now until um, you guys get tired of hearing me. So uh, we have a different topic every couple of weeks, and uh, we should have enough content to get us through uh, through quite a while. 
Uh, we will revisit topics from time to time and of course we can answer uh, we can respond to uh, requests and all that sort of thing uh, in between times um, I'm not I don't have quite a definitive release schedule I'm looking at hopefully doing them in the gap uh, where we're not doing live uh, we will have a couple of these uh, short spotlight things uh, on particular topics uh, for your reference so uh, you don't have to lose too much of a navigator fix I guess <laughs> So always appreciate people checking in from outside the, U the uh, U.S. also. Uh, most of the information we have here as far as clinical trials and things like that uh, and uh, programs and stuff is uh, focused on the United States just because that's where my area of expertise is. Uh, but we definitely like to hear uh, the experience from other people in other systems, uh, other countries, uh, all the way around the world. We've had people from uh, the U.K., we've had people from Australia, we've had people... Um, we have had uh, uh, members from uh, South Africa recently. We had a uh, very strong South African uh, COPD advocate uh, by the name of Peter um, received a, a, a lung transplant, unfortunately passed away from some of the complications. So, um, but we uh, do a lot of this stuff uh, in the memory of those that we have lost so far. Uh, and we of course remember them as we, uh, we contemplate the reach that uh, that we have and we very much appreciate everybody's shared experience uh, people in the group sharing their experience their journey um, the things that have worked the things that don't work I uh, really appreciate hearing everybody's thoughts on things so uh, again not seeing too much in the way of questions so we will go ahead and uh, updated status on the Zephyr procedure um, I will that is one that uh, uh, the Zephyr I believe is the first valves that were approved uh december i believe it was let me uh double check before i start talking too far out of school here but i believe the zephyrs were the ones um zephyr endobronchial valve hey i was right yes um was cleared uh, late last year. I believe they're doing those at a couple of sites uh, in the U.S. I believe that's the one that kind of originated in uh, at Temple uh, out on the East Coast. I believe I heard that we're getting ready to do that here in Michigan as well. I believe I want to say it's Metro Health up in Grand Rapids and I imagine uh, as part of the U of M system uh, the other U of M hospitals won't be far behind that. Um, but that is, uh, it's growing in availability. Um, it is out of the whole experimentation phase. So be sure that you are talking with your, uh, that's going to be something that's going to come from a pulmonologist um, and the evaluation for that. But if you don't have a pulmonologist, talk to your primary care provider, get a pulmonologist, and then get checked out for that. Um, as far as a more detailed update, um, I will uh, do a little bit of research and we will, uh, in I believe we're talking in, I think episode four is going to be about some of the non-surgical options. So that is on the agenda, or I mean the, the non-medication the non -medication options. So things like the Zephyr, the, the valves, the coils, the surgeries, that sort of thing. Uh, so that stuff is definitely on the agenda and will be for some of the, the short takes also. So. All right. So I very much appreciate everybody spending some of your um some of your Wednesday with me today uh, and with the rest of the, the Navigator Nation here. Uh, look for us every two weeks uh, coming at you live through our Facebook page. Uh, look for us on YouTube right now. Search COPD Navigator and if I can get those, I believe, uh, I think I saw Bonnie said she subscribed on YouTube. So now we're down to four more subscriptions uh, so that we can actually get a YouTube channel called COPD Navigator. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, look for more Breathe TV. Look for more Navigator look for more mic uh probably more than you'd ever want to ask for so uh be stay tuned stay in touch um take care of yourselves take care of each other and we'll see you in two weeks